You know, there's so many things that I share on this channel from makeup to politics to Christian news. But one of my absolute favorite things to do on this channel is to share testimonies. And today's no exception. I have on Les Norman, who was a professional baseball player. He was in the minor leagues as well. He had a very tough upbringing. His father was abusive and alcoholic. Even though he was very talented in school, he was very lost, depressed, and he carried that into his professional career. And he had a beautiful encounter with Jesus. He's going to share with us today. But before I get less on to share his amazing testimony, I want to say a quick thank you to the sponsor of this video, Noble Gold Investments. I'll be right back. Noble Gold Investments is pleased to let you know that gold is the best performing asset for 2022. According to longtermtrends.net, gold has actually outperformed the S&P 500, the Dow, and Bitcoin for 2022. So what are you waiting for? Open a gold IRA or silver IRA with Noble Gold Investments this month and receive a free one quarter ounce American Gold Eagle coin with every qualifying IRA. Find out more at noblegoldinvestments.com. Again, that's noblegoldinvestments.com. Les, it's so amazing to have you here. You have such an incredible testimony. You know, you were such a talented kid uh, in, in junior high school, in high school, in college. I'm just going to read this real quick. You were, in college, you were two-time All-American. You voted top 10 best collegiate players in the U.S. You were drafted by Boston. You turned it down. Then you were drafted by the Royals. Mm -hmm. And you join uh, their, their team. But before we get into your testimony, how you found Jesus, I mean, it's really incredible. I want to start with your talented upbringing. Yeah. And then and then we'll jump into some of the harder things. I mean, you've been through a really, really hard life as well. So let's just start with the talent. When did you realize you were talented in baseball and in other sports as well? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Anna. And first, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here with you and then and, and doing this and getting to hang out and, and just be professing the name of Jesus for, for sure. Um, interestingly enough, I didn't really, I had a little bit of talent. Like, I mean, you could, I could run fast and I could throw things really far, throw baseball really far, but you know, I wasn't a good hitter. I wasn't a good shooter in basketball. I didn't play football. It was just little things here and there. And it wasn't really until I was 17. And the ironic thing is that, you know, oftentimes when we go forward in life, we don't really see what God's doing in our life until we look behind us and then say, wow, God, look where, look where you've brought me. How amazing is that? And so I only started even playing baseball um, because I would go home, ride my bike, and I would see some, some kids hanging out at the baseball field once summer broke. And I'd go home, my dad would be yelling and screaming, and we'll get into a little bit more of that. But uh, I, I was tired of it. And so the best thing for me was I want to be a part of, of a friendship group or a baseball group. And I had never played baseball, but I went down there and asked them to let me play. And eventually they did. And it's a little bit longer of a story, but the real talent where I, I realized I might be able to go further than high school with this probably wasn't until I was 17, my junior year, a little bit of late sophomore year at 16 and then early 17, my junior year of high school. Okay. So you were, you were super talented. I mean, that's really what, um, what, what really you loved school. I mean, I, I was playing a lot of sports in school as well. And I loved having, um, having that, but you, you were very open about being medicated through alcohol. I mean, you really had somewhat of an addiction with alcohol. Where did that stem from? Do you want to talk about a, a bit about your past? If you're open to it, I know that it's, it's not easy to talk about. Yeah, it's, you know, over, over the years, um, it, this is really, uh, you know, God's redemption story through me. I mean, growing up um, from the earliest stages I can remember, uh, I watched my biological father abusing alcohol. As I think back, he left when I was 12. Um, I never saw him again after that. And but but from like that age three that I can remember bits and pieces all the way till age 12, that that nine, 10 year span. I really only remember him being sober two different times. And of those two times, he was so sick from being hung over and from withdrawals of, of just abusing alcohol so badly that that's really all I remembered. And so mm -hmm. when I grew up, I was taught that being a man is you, you drink beer, men drink beer and they disrespect women mm -hmm. and women are a conquest to, to um, be to controlled and, and all those different things. And so um, I, I grew up scared scared to death. He was a yeller. He was a screamer. It was always fighting. I watched him uh, punch my mom and blood going over the wall. It was like a horrible CSI 
kind of episode where you're you're like flying the wall at the crime scene, except we were in the crime scene. And you know, I remember being six, seven, eight years old, uh, waking up in my pajamas, running to the police station three blocks away because my dad was abusing my mom and my sister uh, was was young, too. She's three years older than me, but we were just so young. And so um, I just watched him. It was just alcohol, alcohol and medicate, medicate. And so then later on, when when I got into I grew up really insecure because when he left when I was 12 again, and I didn't know the Lord. We didn't go to church. I didn't know what being saved meant. I didn't I, I didn't even I saw what a church looked like. That's about all I could understand. I knew the Bible was a big book. And I think when I sometimes went to the laundromat with my mom, they had those animated Bibles that were really thick, but only like 10 pages. So I remember Noah. I remember Moses. Um, you know, I remember John and seeing Jesus in there. And that was about it. And so um, when, when I got older, I wanted to be the life of the party, being so insecure that the, the, the two things that really drove me, one was sports, well, three things, sports, girls, and then, you know, the popularity of all that. Um, and then um, just being that life of the party and, and, and alcohol was a part of that that made me get rid of my inhibitions. And so um, walking around, just always being medicated with alcohol, it was Anna. Um, it was a horrible way to live, but it was the only way I knew how to cope. You know, very much for me too. I mean, my, my dad left when I was 13. I know your dad left when you were 12. Yeah. Um, when my dad left when I was 13, even though he was a good dad to me, you know, there was so much, it was such a dysfunctional family, you know, yeah. yelling at my mom and they were fighting. My mom became a Christian. He's an atheist. So it was such a dysfunctional upbringing. And I was so happy to see him leave. But at the same time, I was broken because I was a teenage girl that needed my father. And so, of course, I medicated myself with alcohol, too. I was looking for love, <coughs> excuse me, in all the wrong places. Yeah. But, you know, your, your talent really kept you occupied yeah. both in your time and also your mind. Um, talk about how you went from huge high school star, huge college star. You also had, uh, you know, you, you, you had an accident and you had, um, um, you know, you, you, how do I say you had an injury yeah. um, and and then you you were drafted by Boston, but you decided not to play. Talk, talk about that, how you got into the major league baseball league. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Anna. Thank you. Um, the, and, and there's so much. We'll condense it because that's about a three day conference <laughs> talk conversation. Um, uh, when uh, my later years in college, uh, again, um, I was going to I was going to classes barely and I was barely surviving with the GPA. But uh, I started what I didn't realize was after my after my junior year uh, or during my junior year uh, of college, we'd gone to the NAI World Series. We made it to the championship game. And I again, I was voted one of the, the best players in the country. I was sh shattering records at my university um, as a player. And, uh, you know, life was good. Mr. Popular, Mr. Baseball, Mr. All World. I was I was getting national attention and there was a scout that um, had come to the games from Boston. His name was Chuck Coney. And he would always tell me, well, you're projected between the ninth and 14 rounds. You'll get minimum $50,000 to sign. And, and I grew up living in this old trailer park. We didn't have money. My dad had a big construction job, but he never showed up. And come to find out, he had this whole other family in a different state that we didn't even know about. It was never around. And uh, well, not never, but when he was, he was drunk and abusive or he'd be gone. Mm -hmm. And so um, the... God was using that over time to really develop my talent because, again, that was my escape. So when I got to college and got all this fame and all this notoriety, um, I was so disciplined in baseball and working so hard at it because it was my escape. And that's where I found people loved me the most and they kept putting me on this pedestal. I was being worshipped for this talent. So, OK, worship, let me develop it and work harder. More worship, let me develop it and work harder. So I was stuck in this cycle and I didn't mind the pain I was going through and the hard work. So when Boston drafted me, um, when I was told early, they didn't draft me until the 23rd round. And their first offer of a signing bonus after my junior year was $2,000. And being a junior, you have bargaining power. You can say, well, if you're only going to give me $2,000, then I'll just go back to school. I don't need that. And eventually I went to summer ball, was was still crushing it and doing really well and having great success on the field um, and their offer up to 30000 Well, in my mind, I'd heard the scout say 50000 And so, wait a minute. 50,000. I was, I was promised more than that. Um, even on the low side, I wanted more. Well, Anna, to be honest with you, I wanted my education paid for because I didn't finish my senior year. And I wanted the Ford Mustang that I had eyeballed down the street from where my dormitory was. And it was this gray Mustang with 
uh, with a with a soft top, and I was going to be the cool guy in the Mustang convertible. And so I didn't sign. And then I started to get in the the, the pre stages, not knowing it at the time, but pre stages of depression. And um, I I still hit it. Well, come back my senior year. Now I'm getting ki- I got kicked off the fall team again. We were supposed to be great, one of the best teams in the country. I was the captain of the team. I was the leader. Les Norman was going to lead the St. Francis Fighting Saints to their their first national championship, mm-hmm. and yet on the inside I was falling apart. So is that, so, so is that why you were you were kicked off the team because you were drinking and self medicating and women and everything? Well, they didn't. They the coaching staff really didn't know a lot about that, but it started my senior year with this depression and the alcohol and all that other stuff combined. I mean, you know this, when, when we worship things and yeah. we worship and worship and, and they just return void, mm-hmm. we keep searching for other things. And it started to manifest itself in a lot of anger. And the anger I watched my dad just yeah. be infuriated and, and throw down upon my family when I was young, it started to, to come through me. Wow. And I always said, I'll never do that. And yet here I was angry all the time and, and depressed and sad. And my senior year of college is where those suicidal thoughts first started to creep in. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe there'd be something better if I just ended my life, but I never had the guts to do it. And so in the fall of my senior year, the beginning of the year, I was throwing my bat. I was angry. I was getting in fights with my own teammates, my own roommate, for goodness sakes. I mean, it was it was horrible. And so my coach said, Les, you're done for the fall. We can't do this anymore. I could see that I was losing the, the, the respect of all my teammates. Um, the respect of the coaching staff. They didn't kick me off the spring summer team, but uh, I was kicked off. And so, man, it was that was a quick slide into the rest of the way down to depression at that point. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's it's so like you were saying, when you when you people worship you and you have this void in your heart because of everything that you've been through right. physically, emotionally, you know, in your family with your dad. I mean, it, it really like you're saying it was started to come out mm-hmm. and without Jesus. Without yeah. being really healed, that anger that's in the that's really in the spiritual oppression that's now inside of you, it's it's coming out, you know, out of your heart, your mouth speaks. And you and these are the fruits of unrighteousness, you know, living in a very much a heathenous lifestyle, a godless lifestyle, like I did. I mean, we've all been there. Right. Where it's just not you 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 think you're being nice, but you're being so rude and you think you're helping, but it's 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 destroying everything around you. And that's what the enemy loves to do. He loves to destroy, right? Kill, steal, yep. and destroy. Yeah. And so without you able to get a grasp on it, because you really didn't know how to help yourself. You really didn't right. know how to get out of that funk. I get out of that anger because it's very much spiritual and it's it very much, you know, you, uh, we need a heart change. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, so you were kicked off the team mm-hmm. and it was a miracle how the Royals then reached out and drafted you as well. That was a miracle. And you got, you were, you started too. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Interestingly enough, um, you know, back in the whole depression kicked off the team, I, I held everybody. It was like, you know, whoa, don't come near me. Um, I don't need close friends. I don't need anybody in my kitchen. I didn't trust guys, obviously, like father figure types. My mom had been um, in and out of different marriages after my dad left and relationships. And I wanted nothing to do with any of them. A lot of scars and pain from that stuff. So I didn't really trust anybody. And so uh, once the once the spring hit, and and the the normal season and near the end of my senior year college season was there. Um, interestingly enough, I didn't do like on the field. I didn't have the success I had the year before because I was so depressed and so medicating with alcohol. And um, the the jersey became this this big mask for me, like I was hiding behind it. But I wanted everybody to know, hey, I'm the life of the party. But on the inside, man. Again, like I said at the beginning, as I look back, I could really see Satan back. Now I could see Satan trying to isolate me because maybe he saw something in me that God was working in. I don't know, mm. but um, it, it was I was falling apart. And so when that season was over, I thought I've blown my shot. And tell me, Anna, that God doesn't have a sense of humor. Sometimes we think he's also super serious all the time. But, you know, my first offer from Boston the year before was two thousand dollars that went up to thirty thousand. I think I said 50 before, but it went to thirty thousand. My first and only offer from the Royals was $2,000. And I remember looking at the scout saying, can you do any better than $2,000? And he said, son, you've you've used up your eligibility. If you don't sign this contract, you'll probably never play. And so I said, please give me the pen. So what I thought was a bad offer the year before and my selfishness and self-promotion and ego and the narcissistic behavior that I let everybody convince me of that I was, 
it was only two thousand dollars to sign. And so um, I signed the contract. Uh, had, I, I put all the college senior year negativity behind me. And then I started to think again, put the depression on hold, thinking, OK, well, now at least I'm playing. Now I'm going to be in the big leagues. Now I'm going to be rich and famous. Now I'm going to um, re- or live out all the things I said I would be. And you'll you'll see. I'll prove everybody wrong. And so mm-hmm. I will have to play in the minor leagues. And that's when the injury happened. Mm. You know, I was just thinking it's something that we were talking about with depression. Sorry, I have like a cough drop in my mouth. Sure. But the three D's, I wanted to bring this up real quick to just to kind of go back real quick, because this is the devil's three D's. Discouragement leads to depression Mm -hmm. and then death, suicide. Yeah. And God's three D's are discipline, determination and dependency on God. You go, girl. I love that. You know, and, and, and I give all credit to my pastor because she was the one that always brings us up the three D's. And I just messaged her. What was the first D on, 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 on the devil's discouragement? That's what I was trying to remember. It was a discouragement. And, you know, being discouraged as a kid, not being uplifted, not being told, you know, who you are in God, not knowing God. And then also not having dependency on God, but dependency on yourself. Yeah. You know, you're standing on not solid foundation. You're standing on sand and quicksand. Right. And yeah. so. Here you are. God still had such a grace and a favor on you, Les, that he said, you know what? I'm still going to give you a chance because it was your heart's desire to be in the major leagues. And what's amazing is that you were actually drafted by the Royals. (laughs) Hallelujah. You know, it was the royal family, the real royal family is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So talk about that because you then joined the team. Again, you, um, you started, but for some reason, you know, you weren't playing well that first year. Right. And you actually ended up having an injury yeah. and um, you fell into a deeper depression and again, suicide. And you actually, you know, met a coach there who was slowly dripping seeds about the gospel, about Jesus. So talk about that now, now that, you know, you're with the Royals. Um, when did you start hearing about the Lord? Man, such great questions, you know, and I look at that post you put up about the three D's from, from what the devil does, the, 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 the discouragement, the depression and death. I, if death is is number three of that 3.0, I was at 2.9999. I mean, I was I was right there on the cusp of it. And so I, I went out to Eugene, Oregon, where our short season team was. And again, you have low A ball where I was, then high A, then double A, then triple A, then the big leagues. So you got to climb all those ladders to get up to the major leagues. And mm-hmm. I was still convinced, like, okay, well, you know, I'm still gonna now I'm here. Forget last year, I'm ready to go. And I'd never hit with a wood bat before. And we had guys on the team that were drafted from California and Arizona and New Mexico and Florida and Alabama. I mean, all these Southern and Western States where it's, it's nice year round. We're in the Chicago suburbs, you know, it, it's, you might get 30 games in if you're lucky, unless you advance deep in the tournament and they're getting 150. So, and I, we never hit with wood bats up there. And I was struggling. I was absolutely struggling. And I, it was another rude awakening. It was another let down, another sense of, well, now I'm depressed. Now I'm not the player I thought I was. I can't hit like these guys. They mm-hmm. drafted a guy from Alabama who now is a friend of mine, but they drafted a guy from Alabama who was a right fielder in the first round. So I knew as soon as he reported for duty in Eugene, Oregon, I was done playing. And that's exactly what happened. And so the, the question you asked on when you play pro ball and baseball, every Sunday they have what's called just a chapel service. And because you play on Sundays and you may not go to church on Sunday night, or if you're on a road trip or something like that, they'll have a guest speaker come in, or maybe the chapel leader of that home team, or if you're on the road, a visiting team, will have like a, a, a quick little devotional for you. They'll make an announcement. It's a time when both teams, either both teams can come together when, when you're not taking batting practice or, um, one team will come and one's hitting and then they'll flip flop. And so I decided to come, but, but Anna, again, God is so amazing. I thought at the time, the reason I was going to show up for chapel was because I had raised so much hell for six days in my partying ways and, and just mm-hmm. not even considering that God even exists. I mean, I knew, I believe he existed, but you know, I thought I was a nice guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's guy. Actually, sorry to interrupt. Let's actually talk about that because you, you know, again, you're in the major leagues. Now you have money. Now you have prestige. Now oh, you have almost, that. Almost. Almost in the major leagues. I mean, the minor leagues working my way up to the big leagues. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, right. You're, you're on your way to the, to, to the major leagues and you have women and 
you're getting your reputation back again and as a star. And, and so again, the, the world is so enticing, but again, you were still broken and lost and yep. thinking you're a good guy, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but really inside you're broken, but continue. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and, you know, I, I, sorry for the air quotes. So this, yeah, it's, I got my box in here. I got to bring my hands in. I would go to chapel on Sundays thinking that I was there, that I just had to, I just had to get clean one day because then once Monday hit, I would just go ahead and, and raise whatever I needed to raise. And, but, but it was just so empty. And the, the, the mask of the Jersey was starting to crack because I wasn't able to hide all the things that I'd kept bottled up and all the loneliness and the depression and the sadness and the discouragement. But we had a first base coach named Bobby Meacham. He played for the Yankees and he was our chapel leader and, and he would have conversations. And I was used to college coaches yelling when you failed. I was definitely used to a dad that would yell. And, you know, for, for my dad, when he got mad, just to get mad, he would say, go cut me a switch. And we had this tree outside and I would have to cut a branch and hand it to him and then lay on my bed, take my shirt off and just let him have it at my back. I mean, that's how I grew up. And so I just, I just didn't trust men, but there was something different about Bobby Meacham. And I didn't know what it was, but when Bobby got on us for maybe not working hard or making a mistake, it wasn't personal to me. He, I felt like for the first time, there was a father figure type that actually cared about me as a person mm -hmm. instead of what he could get out of me. Or I didn't look at him like I needed him to elevate me so I could prove myself uh, with, with these words of affirmation that, that were so hollow and so false and fake. Mm -hmm. And so I hung around him more. And when he spoke, I listened to what he had to say. I was working hard in baseball. But I was paying more attention and more attention and asking more questions like, wait a minute, what is this personal relationship with Jesus? What is that all about? And and he would share it. Um, but then a, a couple times uh, a, a spot had opened up in the outfield. And so I started playing and my batting average went from 169 up to 245. And I was hitting some home runs and I was starting to be successful. But this time on the success part of it, it wasn't about, yeah, check me out. Check this dude out. It was wow, this, this game is, I, I'm, I'm a part of a team. I'm with someone I look up to. Mm -hmm. And then the big injury happened and I'd separated my left shoulder. It was a play at the plate. I dove head first, which I don't recommend for any baseball players out there unless you have to, but um, I dove head first, separated my left shoulder, tried to get up and couldn't tore a bunch of muscles and tendons and ligaments in my shoulder socket. And it was eventually going to need a full reconstruction. But um, the, the next game we were at home, my arm was in a sling. It had already been diagnosed, and I was on some some light medication. But the the game had started without me. And Anna, this is so selfish at the time, but I remember thinking, plain as day, I can't believe the game is going on without me. Don't they know I'm hurt? I'm such an integral part of this team. Don't they realize that I'm in here hurt, and they should be waiting for me? And then I remember thinking, you know, Satan, I've worshipped you. And there's no return because all of a sudden now there was nothing. The, the, the newspapers weren't wanting to write an article. That's back mm -hmm. when we had newspapers. There wasn't as much of an Internet as there is now. Um, it, my family wasn't calling me. My friends just kind of, oh, well, you're not the life of the party anymore. And I was really alone. Yeah. And so I sat in the clubhouse in that moment. I'll end with this. I, I sat in the clubhouse, arm in a sling, kind of sitting on a stool like I am right now. But thinking life well, is like going going on without you. And you yeah. just feel like you're left behind. Yeah, absolutely. And it was such a lonely feeling yeah. that I couldn't deal with it. I was at that 0.299 or 2.99 part where death was imminent for me. And so I made the decision to go to my apartment, didn't know how, and there it is. You can see it on the screen right there. I was, I was just past the arrow approaching that death mark. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to take my own life tonight. I don't know how, but mm -hmm. I can't function. I can't live without this. And so um, mm -hmm. I'm worthless. I'm nothing. Everybody sees it. I've got nothing to offer. And therefore, I don't need to be alive. Wow. So here you are sitting in that clubhouse mm -hmm. and contemplating taking your own life. I think it was that night. Yeah. Really? I mean, you were right there. The yeah. enemy was like, I have you. Perfect. This is it. Your life is over. Yep. You're done. You're yeah. out. No one cares about you. No one wants you. Why not just take your own life? You feel miserable. The pain will no. be over. I mean, yes. these are all the little things that the demons just start saying, and it's and they're and they're as they're laughing. There's a lot. It's just, just all like, over my head. The voices, just constant barrage. 
And you know what? I, I was actually talking to uh, recently. I, I was at an event and I was sharing my testimony from being, you know, an atheist poker player, thinking mm -hmm. I'm on top of the world to depression and everything like that. And did, thought about suicide, but I knew I would never do it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I was sharing my testimony. And this gentleman come, runs up to me after I get off stage and he said, you know, I have to say, I, I have to get this off my chest. I said, what is it? He said, I just was at, uh, I've been playing poker for a long time. Your story really resonated. And I was sitting in my car contemplating suicide that day. And I literally saw demons. He said, I saw these wow. imps flying around saying, we got you, you're ours. You're out. He literally saw them and heard them speak to him. And he, his mm -hmm. spirit cried out and said, no, I don't want to die. I don't want to go to hell. And that was when he laid, gave his life to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he ended up trying to go back to the casino, was walking in, and and the and he just like saw this line, don't cross this line. Because mm -hmm. it's over if you cross that line. So there's a there's a really fine line that we when we cross, I mean, you were right there. You all you yeah. had to do was mm -hmm. have to go forward. That was the line. And that, yeah. you know, God really meets us where we're at. He, you know, for me, I was depressed on my knees and cried out, and the Lord met me. So with you, so what happened in that moment? You're, you have your hand, your arm in a sling, yeah. your life is done. What happens? What makes you decide, you know what? I don't want to take my life. I do want to pursue God. What happened? It was, Anna, literally within seconds of the final thought of tonight is the night. Don't know how, but I'm ending it. And that's an empty clubhouse. Everybody was out. The trainer, the coaches, the manager, everybody's outside. The game's starting. I can hear the crowd. I can hear the... Uh, the announcements on the, the loudspeaker. And I just sat there like, well, nobody cares. Okay, I'm done. And in that next second, to my left from the door, I'm kind of stuck in the corner where my locker was. And here comes Bobby Meacham, our first base coach, our chapel leader, the guy that I respected, the only guy that I respected because what he said matched everything that he did and everything that he did matched everything you said. I mean, Anna, I would watch after a game. We might have just lost by 15 runs. And out in the parking lot after the game, he would always – his three little kids would run up, climb up his legs, wow. and he always went to his bride first and gave her a kiss and a hug and looked her in the eye with a soft, wonderful, loving face. And then mm -hmm. he stood up his kids. I'm like, I never had that. I want that. And and mm -hmm. that's the guy that – And he was consistent. He oh, was consistent. absolutely. The, the first man in my life ever that I saw wow. consistency without even saying the word. And so in that moment, he came through and I just every bit of everything I was hanging on to for years just came out in tears and sobbing. And I said, Meech, called him Meech, Bobby Meacham. I said, Meech, there's something different about you, man. I got to know because I'm literally dying here. And mm -hmm. instead of going out to coach like he got paid to do. I don't even know why he came back in the dugout. Maybe he forgot his lineup card. I don't know. I don't remember. But he <laughs> stayed in that clubhouse and sat down with me and walked through the gospel for me. And I sat there. And, I, and it wasn't even in that moment that I gave my life. But I knew something was different. And in that instant, I no longer wanted to take my life anymore. I, I was I was excited. I didn't care about the whole baseball and all the other stuff. And so after that game, we got on a road trip and they had to take me to monitor my progress. And so within a week, probably a little bit less, it was about three in the morning. We're coming home on a bus trip uh, from somewhere like in Yakima, Washington or something like that, or maybe Spokane. And I was looking out the window and I, I literally felt my heart as if it was going to come out of my chest. But I, I felt like the Lord's presence was right there with me telling me now is the time. And so three in the morning, you got minor league dudes laying on the floors and seats and smelly bus and all that. I just got on my knees in that muck and leaned down in my chair uh, and, and just prayed, Lord, I, I need you. If this is you, please, please save me. I realize what I've done. I'm a sinner. And I gave my life to the Lord in that moment. And um, yeah, the suicide, the depression, all of that stuff, just it, it, it lifted and um, gave my life to the Lord, became a believer. And interestingly enough, right after that moment, I sat up in my seat, again in tears, but trying to be quiet. Again, it's a bus three in the morning. I don't want to wake anybody up. And besides the driver, I noticed there's one light in the front of the bus, just one light in the very front right side seat. And it was Bobby Meacham reading his Bible. And you, you talk about, yeah. you talk about spiritual warfare. And you know, a man that was going to bat for me, that Ephesians 6, that, 
you know, it, it's not against flesh and blood. It, it, it's what goes on behind the scenes in this, this spiritual world of darkness that's out there. And they were battling to try to get me back to that day of taking my own life. And Meech was praying and he was reading and he went to bat for me. And I'm, I'm so thankful for Meech. And this may be another time, but I got to see him years later, about six, seven years later. Um, and I just ran up to him. We were on the road in Nashville. I just ran up to him and jumped in his arms and got to tell him the story. And Wow. Yeah. What did he yeah. say? T tell me. I, we we want to hear what he said when you told well, him sure. that. Well, we finished that season out. And, and when I went to chapel, it was different. You know, every, everything was different. And um, my my teammates like, dude, why are you not drinking? Why are you not having a beer? Why are you not? And, you know, I would share what happened with, with some of my teammates. And and I, I was ridiculed and all that. But none of that mattered. Um, I, it was I was just a different guy. And I knew my season was over. But I knew that once that season was over now, instead of playing for that name on the back, my last name, Norman, and it was all about me, I went to the next season thinking I'm going to play for not just the Royals on the front and be a good teammate, but I want to be a godly influence. I want to be a godly man. And so mm -hmm. if for the first time in my life, maybe until back at the day when I was little and baseball was an escape, I finally started to play the game for joy, for his pleasure, to understand mm -hmm. that this was a gift. And that's when I look behind me and like, God, mm -hmm. I didn't know you. And I slandered your name and I did horrible things. And yet you stayed with me the whole time and put somebody in my life in the exact second that I needed him. And then six years later, back in the minor leagues, we were in Nashville. You, know, you just came from there, I think, but I did. We were, we were in Nashville and it was a, we were in AAA at the time and I'd been to the big leagues and back down and he was a coach of the team. And I didn't know he was coaching this team. I hadn't talked to him in a couple of years and he was just leaning against the fence. And we had to, we had to go across their dugout to get to our dugout. And I saw him, and I look back and like Meech, he's like, less. I just sprinted and just fell into his arms in tears because he could have been the guy that said, Hey, I'll talk to you later. I got to go coach. Mm -hmm. but instead, he had compassion. Um, mm -hmm. He had sympathy. He cared about me. He knew what was important. It was people over projects. Yeah. And he was Jesus for me in that moment. Cause that's exactly what Jesus would have done. He would have loved me where I was and yeah. lifted me from that mire. And so, um, yeah, it was a really, it was a really cool uh, reunion in that moment. That's amazing. And I'm, I'm sure you told him the story in that brief yeah. moment. We're able to tell him I was contemplating suicide. I was going to kill myself. Yeah. It's so amazing how the Lord knows the desires of our heart. And the Lord also knows our upbringing. You know, he doesn't judge us. I mean, you grew up with an ultra abusive alcoholic father. Yeah. You didn't know better. You weren't taught better. You weren't disciplined. You know, you you were disciplined in the game to to an extent You because you had such talent. You know, and 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 it's it, it's it's amazing how God meets us where we're at. Like for me with Survivor, it's it's a little bit similar. Even though I didn't have an injury, it was the biggest desire of my heart. I wanted to play. God allowed me to play, go on, and then I was taken out halfway in the most craziest way that was out of my control. And every single person on the on the show said, including the host Jeff Probst, said you were the only one Anna on the show that couldn't control her destiny. It was already planned for you. Mm. everyone every single person wow. on the show and when i left the show i was knocked out early i thought i was gonna win i mean come on right so wow. i fell into a depression and then i went down the rabbit hole and found jesus and so i understand now looking back i understand why the lord allowed it because if i would have went farther and i would have maybe even won they would have invited me back i mean i would have wanted to and it would have kept going that cycle would have kept going do you think at all that the lord it was like divine intervention Obviously, you gave your life to him, so yes. But um, do you do you believe it was a divine intervention that you know that stronghold of baseball? He really he wanted to then transition you into his perfect will, yeah. Really, which is which is to really dedicate your life to him. Because talk about what you're doing now. I mean, there's so much you're doing now for the Lord. So go ahead. So do you do you think that he allowed it? Oh man, I mean, God was in it the whole time. Even when I was eight years old, going to that baseball field for the first time playing baseball, God had his plan. He had his will ready. And of course, it, it wouldn't be till I was 22, almost 23, 15 years later, I wouldn't realize it, but that doesn't matter because God knew. And, um, oh my gosh, I'm so unbelievably thankful. So yeah, I ended up, um, instead of going to uh, uh, getting released, they were going to release me because after that season, 
I had gone to back to spring training because they have to bring you back because, you know, when you get hurt, they have to pay for surgery, get you fixed, make sure you're okay. And then once you're okay and you have full doctor's clearance to get on the field, they can release you in that moment if they want to. So I got down there and we had a manager that, that um, really went to bat for me and wanted me to be like a backup outfielder in low A ball. And Anna, listen, if you're a backup outfielder on the lowest of low minor league teams, pretty good chance uh, unless you get a job in the concession stand, you're probably going to get released. And so he went to bat for me and I went to Appleton, Wisconsin, which was, again was, was a ball, but a full season. And my outlook was different because my thought was, look, Lord, if I've got to sell hot dogs, if I got to chase foul balls and keep the scorebook, I'm just happy to have this Jersey. So you do your will and not mine. Cause I'm still in this game. And I would just keep having these memories of what it was like on the way up and all the things that, that God got me through and mm -hmm. forgave me and, and showed me grace. Even when I, I knew, I didn't know he was showing me grace. And so the game all of a sudden that year slowed down for me. I mean, I had all this talent before, but I didn't realize how good of a player I was. And I went from being a backup to making the all-star team at the break and leading the league and hitting. And in my first full season, I went from getting released and wanting to take my own life. Two and a half years later, I would walk into the stadium in Kansas City at Kauffman Stadium and make my major league debut. I mean, that is unheard of. It's crazy. I think the total was three years, maybe. But but yeah, God is, and I, I know I played a year and a half in the big leagues. I was, again, I was a backup there, but it was okay because remember, my plan was to be this rich and famous and wealthy superstar, all-star, make hundreds of millions of dollars. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But instead what happened was I met my my bride of now, um, actually in six days from when we're, we're recording this, we're celebrating our 26th anniversary. And I've got two sons. Yay. Yay. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. You okay. know, I've got a son that's 21 and he's in mm -hmm. nursing school. And I've got a, an 18 year old who's a senior in high school and a sophomore in college simultaneously. And they're healthy and strong and they're great athletes and they're smart. But the most important thing is that they love the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's we all go to church together and we go to youth group together and they lead their own things. And, um, I've seen God use now the little bit of time I had in the big leagues for his platform. Cause now I'm in radio, I'm on TV, I'm a, I'm a speaker, but I get to help students. I get to help men in ministry. Um, yeah. God has given me a platform to preach the gospel to other people and to, to use the life that he pulled me through mm -hmm. to give him glory and lead others to the Lord. I mean, I got to, I got to lead my, my 21 year old when he was 10, I was a leader at youth camp and I got to lead my own son to the Lord when he was 10. And so um, God is amazing. He's always been amazing. And any part of my story needs to give him the glory because I wouldn't be here without him. Amen. And praise God. All glory to God. You know, he gives a platform to the most unsuspe unsuspecting people. <laughs> and he knows. I mean, really. I mean, yeah. and, and it's so amazing how you really were called out. Yeah. You know, in baseball, you were out. You're mm -hmm. called out for a divine purpose. I mean, I'm going to read. You touched on some of the things you're doing now, but you're a pastor, ministry, business, keynote speaker, leadership consultant, men's Christian, um, executive life coach, radio and podcast host. I was just on your show, and it was so amazing. I I, I loved your podcast. You're an Thank excellent you reader. But you did a great job. It was fun. You guys need. So I'm going to have a link down below for you guys to watch it, listen to it as well. It was a really fun interview. Um, Casey Royals, TV analyst for Royals Blue Zone show i don't watch sports on spectrum sports college high school baseball softball tv analyst i mean you have so much that you're doing and again the platform that the lord allow you to have to now preach the gospel and use yeah. it for his glory because you went from discouragement depression to death almost no. death to real discipline determination and dependency on god Amen. that's where you really find the fulfillment so i want you to um you know if you have anything else you want to share and then close us out in prayer yeah, I would be honored to do that. Yes, um, thanks. You know, I, I guess to share it is there's so many people out there that uh, from whatever wounds of the past, you know, one of the, the most important things I learned in my life, and it took me a while to learn, was is that a lot of people that have, a, have father wounds, when they're growing up, they start to put what they know about their father, what might be anger, frustration, abuse, impatience, insecurity. I mean, my dad 
countless times looked me in the eye and said, hey, you are a worthless piece of you know what, and you were a mistake and you shouldn't even be here. And so when I was introduced to God for the first time, there was still that battle of me thinking that if I fail, God's going to be mad at me. And it took me a long time to discover what grace really was. And so the thing I want to share and leave with people is that is not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of the universe. The God of the universe doesn't want us to sin. Of course, it's what separates us from God. But we have to remember that, you know, one of my favorite verses is Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Plop everything in there you want to be. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. And even as Christians, we often walk through a time where we're still putting ourselves on that guilt and, and look Jesus has your picture on his refrigerator. He saw your face when he went to the cross and he loves you so unbelievably much that we can have that freedom from the, the guilt and the freedom from fear. I mean, you know, fear is not of God. God doesn't want us to live that way. And so when we really truly believe and trust in how God sees us and what he did for us, you talk about a life that is filled. You talk about a life that it can really give glory to God and lead others to the very throne of grace. Oh my goodness. It is such an incredible joy. I think back about those times of, man, I can't believe I wanted all that money and all that fame and all those things <laughs> crazy because there's no joy in it. I've met being in baseball. I still coach Royals fantasy camp and I'm around these guys all the time. The most unhappy people that I've met in the world are millionaires are multimillionaires because, Oh, I, I accumulated it. I got it. I got it. And now what? Now what is the key question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now what? And so for those of you out there, if you if you're watching and you you haven't given your life to the Lord, um, I want you to really investigate God's word. Read Romans, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Um, read John 14, 6, John 3, 16. Really understand how much God loves you and it, you don't have to get right to come to him. He wants you right where you are because he loves you. He made you and he created you and he's got such a wonderful life planned for you if you just surrender to him and you'll, you'll see what i'm talking about so mm. uh, yeah, i guess i would end with that um i'm still mm. a knucklehead i still make mistakes just like you anna we're we're just we're yeah. goofy knuckleheads that love jesus love jesus and we we're, yeah. we're not perfect but right. we're being delivered daily and we're looking more and more like jesus by his grace I want to touch on something then we'll close out in prayer yeah. what you were talking about regarding fatherhood and the father wounds yeah. it's interesting when you look at some of the most well-known atheists in the world you know including freud including nietzsche all of them and and even steve steve hawkins all of them had very bad father wounds yeah. they were either left by their father at a young age or they died or they were physically or mentally abused by their father and so yeah. they have that that, that father wound. So they, it's hard for them to receive father, God in heaven. It's a hard mm -hmm. step to take. And I, well and, right. And I'm sure you experienced that as well. I mean, I have uh, some family members who are deeply, deeply pained by their father. And I know that's the gap. So yeah, I've been praying yeah. for them. And I know in Jesus name, they're going to get saved yeah. right there. Cause when I share about the love of the father, it's like, Ooh, you know, at first it was, they don't want to hear it because there's no way that's possible. And now they're open to it. Now they're starting to see, really, it's the love of God that mm -hmm. led him to bring Jesus down. Yeah. And that's the love of the, of the Father. And so when you if, you, if you understand how much God loves you and that he really has a beautiful plan for your life and nothing you've ever done will ever separate you from his love, nothing you've ever done will, will have him chastise you in a way that he never wants to see you again. No. Instead, yeah, yeah. He, he has a solution. And that solution is Jesus. Yeah. Jesus paid the price. He paid the price on the cross. Look, I was an atheist. So were you. I thought it was nuts. I thought, you dying on a cross? That's crazy. You know, yeah. what does that have to do with the real world? Well, the real world is actually the spiritual world. It is so real. It's more real than this natural world. And so right. if, you, if you're moved by this broadcast, if you're moved by Les's testimony of how he went from a life of, you know, alcohol and women and, and coveting money and things and fame and prestige, and he was broken inside, almost committed suicide. Mm -hmm. If that's you, if that somehow resonates with you, Les, what do, what, what do they do? What do they say? How do they how do they bridge that gap that you did? Yeah, it's, it's just something simple. I mean, in that moment, I just I, I realized how much God loves me. And it's all about the repentance and confession. I just needed like I needed to confess to my Lord in prayer. And it, it didn't it doesn't have to be some perfect thing. You know, God created us and he just wants us to talk to him. 
And yes. so I just got down on my knees and said, Lord, I realize now I need you. I am a sinner and I can't live my life without you. So I invited the Lord Jesus and said, Lord, I invite you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Save me. Thank you for dying for my sins. And it literally was something as simple as that. And I mean, it was mm -hmm. heartfelt. I mean, it's not words yeah. that get you into heaven. I mean, we could say anything we want to say, but if they don't have meaning, then there's no substance to it. There's no foundation. But in those heart moments where you realize, man, I really do need a savior. Jesus, John 14, 6, mm -hmm. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father, but through me. Um, and it's not this list of rules. It's not this thing that you have to live up to because we can't. Jesus is the only perfect one. He loves you that much. He died for you. So it's just simply yeah. confessing you're a sinner, repenting of your sin and saying, Lord, I invite you to come into my heart and, yeah. and now I live for you. And he will do that very thing for you. Yes. John 1, 12, one of my favorites to, to summarize what it says in John 1, 12, it says, believe in Jesus, receive him into your heart and you will become a child of God. Mm -hmm. Believe plus receive equals become. And so with that being said, Les, it was an honor to have you here. Thank you for sharing your wonderful testimony with us. It's, an, it's, it's not easy. I know it's like looking back on the past, but I know it, it's, it's a, Revelation 12, 11 says we overcome him, which is the enemy yeah. by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And I know I, one of my favorite things to share on this, on, I talk about so many things on, on my channel here, but one, my favorite are testimonies. And Amen. so thank you for sharing your testimony. And I, I'm, I'm honored. And, and I just want to say thank you. I know this isn't about you. It's about the Lord and what he's done in your life. It's not about mm -hmm. me. It's about what the Lord's done in my life. But we need to act in obedience. You know, God doesn't need us for one second but he invites mm -hmm. us to go through life with him. So mm -hmm. my sister in the Lord, I just want to say thank you for all that you do. And, and you're a champion for the gospel. You're a champion for Jesus. And, and one of the things I love about your ministry is that, that you don't kowtow to people. You don't step around the outsides. You speak truth. If people are going to be offended, it's not the intention, mm -hmm. but people are going to be offended with truth, they're still going to hear the truth. And, and the world needs more people like you, Anna Kate. So please continue to do what you're doing as the Lord calls you to do it. And uh, I will do the same. So thank you so much. All glory to Jesus. You guys check out his podcast, his shows. They are really, really good. Les is funny and he's just, he's witty and he's a great, great host. So thank you, Les, again. It was an honor to have you on here and check us out next time. Yeah. And make sure you guys, by the way, I always forget to say this, like, subscribe, comment on the video to fix up the algorithms, because guess what? We want the atheists to click on this video. They're going to see, whoa, Major League Baseball player finds Jesus. I want to watch that. So make sure you comment, like, subscribe, share, and, you know, do the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Be blessed, you guys. Bye, Les. It's an honor again. Absolutely. Should we pray, though, before we go out? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Can Let's you lead us out in prayer? I would love to. Yes. Father God, we thank you so much for this broadcast. We thank you so much for your son. We pray that those are listening would find the joy of the Lord and that they would uh, just come unto salvation, that you would reveal yourself to them in a mighty way and know how much they are loved. And for those that already know you, um, continue to equip them, Lord, and give them your courage and give them your strength and fill them with your Holy Spirit to preach the gospel, to spread the good news. We live in a time in history, Lord, that is uh, it. it People, the, the the lines are getting blurred between what's yes. good and what's evil, mm -hmm. and it is everywhere. And and Satan is so active trying to just thwart anything. And Lord, we just ask that your mighty hand stamp him down, and that uh, those out there hearing and listening and mm -hmm. seeing would just come to a saving faith in you. To you be all the glory, and we just pray your blessing over Anna and, and her channel here as well. And um, speak to her like you always do. We love you. We thank you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Bye, guys.